But sometimes water can get contaminated and so forth. And, and you need water for other things, to feed your animals, to wash your clothes and wash your So, you know, water is precious too, uh, pure water. But uh, with, with wine, it's already purified. The, the grape vine purifies the grapes. And uh, so the wine, being alcoholic, is very pure. And, uh, and it was a main drink, and it still is in many parts of the world. But uh, to have a lot of wine well, was a very uh, prosperous thing to do. The more wine you had, the better your, your bigger your vineyards, the better your wine. Uh, the more wine you have, it just was a sign of prosperity. If you didn't have much wine, uh, that was kind of a sign of being poor, you know? Uh, when Jesus turned water into wine at the wedding of Cana, his very first miracle, uh, that was a big deal. To run out of wine at your wedding feast, that was, that was embarrassing. It made you look poor. And so Jesus uh, saved the day when he miraculously turns the water into wine. Uh, and then, you know, everybody was just amazed. You saved the best wine to last. You must be really well off to have wine this good. Best wine I've ever tasted, you know. Uh, but it was a sign of prosperity and what we're doing well. The Bible says wine makes glad the heart of man. It's a blessing of God. Now, drunkenness, that's different. But the Bible says take a little wine for your stomach's sake. It's good. It's good medicine. It... Uh, it's good for your digestion. It's, it's a gift of God. So uh, Jesus uh, not only turned water into wine, but at the Passover meal, he took wine, the cup, and said, this is my blood. And uh, so today we will receive wine at the Lord's Supper. And it is the carrier of the blood of Christ. In with and under that wine is the blood of Jesus himself. And we take it, and we eat it, and we drink it. And that means we have taken Christ into ourself, and he's become part of us, and he dwells in us, as we'll see in the sermon on this Pentecost Sunday, where Jesus says that to his disciples in John. Uh, uh, that, that God dwells in us. And he says, take this. Take my body and take my blood. It means believe in it. Believe in me. Take me into yourself. Don't just wear me on the outside, you know, call yourself a Christian when you're really not inside. Take me inside. So wine is a very big thing. And uh, absolutely nothing wrong with it. All these churches that say uh, wine or alcohol is a sin, that's totally false doctrine. The Bible doesn't say that. It says the opposite, uh, that we are commanded to drink wine in the Lord's Supper, for example, uh, and, and uh, take a little wine for your stomach's sake and so forth. So uh, it's, a, it's a blessing of God. Now, to drink too much of it, obviously, is a sin. But the wine itself is not sinful. Drunkenness is the sin. But you can drink wine without getting drunk. Okay? That's like any, th any other gift of God. You can abuse it. And that's what sin is. We take these gifts of God and abuse them. Don't use them the way God intended them to be used. So fermentation is a gift of God. And uh, so wine, especially back then, was a, was a very precious commodity. Um, and they, they grew a lot of it and produced a lot of it. So when it talks here about the vine and the grapes and the blood of grapes, which is wine, uh, it's, a, uh, it's an image that, that the Holy Ghost is painting in our minds of prosperity and affluence and being well off, which is that's a great thing. God would have all of us to have many, many blessings even in this sinful world. As we've talked about before, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were all very wealthy people. And God blessed them in this way. And 
As Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. All these worldly things. So there's nothing wrong with that. But to worship it more than God, to, to love it more than God, to trust it more than God, that's the sin. That's making these earthly things idols. But you don't have to make them your idols. And, and here is one of those passages in the Bible where God is saying, Judah is going to be very blessed with earthly affluence, just like his father Jacob was, and so forth. So let's look at these uh, images, these poetic images here in verse 11. First of all, binding his foal to the vine. Okay, what does that mean? Well, it means you're going to have so big of vineyards. Your vineyards are going to be so vast. You're going to have such a large vineyard. Your, your descendants will have such great vineyards in a, such abundance that you won't care if you take your, if somebody takes uh, your donkey or his donkey and ties it to a vine. What it says here, binding, tying your donkey, your foal, unto the vine, that's like saying, uh, what would happen if you, if you tie your donkey to a grapevine? What might happen? Exactly, Terry. You're right on. You're thinking the way the Holy Ghost wants you to think here. Wow. Who would tie their donkey to their grapevine? What do you usually tie your donkey to? Yeah, something that he can't either pull out of the ground, or if he does pull out of the ground, it doesn't matter. But the grapevines are so precious. That's, that's like your money in the bank. But you're going to have such big vineyards. You're going to have so many grapevines that you're going to get kind of careless with them. You're going to start tying up your donkey to him, and you won't care if he rips it out of the ground because you'll have so many more. This is a this is like nobody is going to tie their donkey to their grapevine. That'd be stupid. But you're going to have so many of them, you're going to get even kind of careless with them. That's what that means, you know, to tie your to bind your foal to your to your vine. That's something that just wasn't done unless you had, unless you could afford to lose the vine. You had so many more of them. And then it goes on to say, uh, in that verse 11, he washed his garments in wine. Now, why would you do that? What do you usually wash your garments in? Water. But he's saying you're going to be so rich you're going to be so affluent that, that uh, you're going to have more what than what? That's right. You're going to have more wine than water. You're going to, you're, you're going to be so abundantly blessed with earthly things it, that, that your wealth is going to be like water. It's going to be as plentiful as water. That, that you're going to be tempted to say, well, I'll save the water because i got more grape juice. I'm going to wash my clothes in grape juice because i got more of it than water. Uh, so what he's saying here is that Judah's tribe would enjoy prosperity. It's going to receive the richest allotment of land in Canaan. Uh, the land of Judah, the land allotted to the tribe of Judah, it will be this land right here, this, this pink and this green. That will be Judah's. Now, he's going to have to share some of it with Simeon, but he gives Simeon the worst part of it because you're getting down more into the desert of Sinai here. But this is rich territory up here. This is going to be like central Illinois. They're going to get the best, most fertile uh, farmland, and that's where the wealth came from. Okay? So, 
what he's what he's prophesying here for uh, Canaan is a rich allotment in Canaan for his tribe, and they will be blessed with abundance. But in a larger sense, in a larger sense, this is not as great as verse 10. That's just earthly blessings in verse 11. What did he have in verse 10? When, huh? Go ahead. Yeah, you have the Messiah. You've got eternal life in heaven. Through him, you'll have peace with God forever. And the riches of heaven, the joys of heaven, the blessings of heaven will be infinitely greater than any blessings of this earth. They're going to have them both. But the greater blessing is to come in heaven. So when Jacob is laying on his deathbed here and he's he kind of is propping himself up with his last strength and he's talking to his 12 sons. When he looks at Judah, what does he see? He sees beyond Judah and he sees two things. First he sees your, your, your descendants are going to be rich. I see wealth there. They're going to have good land and prosperity earthly, but I see even a greater thing when I look at Judah. What do I see? I see Shiloh. I see the peace bringer, the one who brings peace between God and man. I see their, our Savior for all eternity. That's far more important. He sees these two things when he sees Judah. But he talks about a scepter in verse 10. How kings and kingdoms will come from Judah. There will be a kingdom of Judah. But he sees far more than that. He sees an eternal kingdom. The eternal, the one who will hold the scepter forever. Shiloh. And you talk about prosperity. He is the one who brings infinite prosperity, infinite abundance, infinite riches, infinite joy forever. And that is uh, Shiloh, who will come from his son Judah. And that blessing will not be just for Judah, not just for his descendants and his tribe. That blessing will be for all people. As uh, God had promised to Abraham when he called him, from your seed, every family on earth will be blessed. Or as he says at the end of verse 10, unto Shiloh shall the gathering of the people be. All people. All people. Jew and Gentile will come to Jesus from all over the world because he will die for the sins of the whole world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus said, I came that you may have life and have it more abundantly. So, yes, there will be earthly blessings for Judah's tribe, but far more than that, uh, Shiloh will bring this eternal kingdom of infinite, abundant prosperity for all people who trust in him, all believers in Christ. Uh, here's a king that will have a kingdom and a reign that will go on forever, and it will be a kingdom of peace, not war. It will be a kingdom of joy, not sorrow. It will be a very joyful kingdom that Shiloh brings. You know, the world thinks it has a lot to offer us. This sinful world, the unbelievers, they offer us, they promise us things. Oh, do this and you'll be happy. Do that and you'll be happy. Buy this, do that. Live our way. It makes big promises to people. 
makes big promises to people. It offers peace. It offers joy too, doesn't it? It offers good things, but does it deliver? Can it deliver on its promises? No. What do you get in this world? Yeah, sorrow and death. This is a a veil of tears. In the world, despite all of its promises to you, cannot deliver. Only Jesus can deliver. Only Jesus, God the Son, makes good on his promises that he gives you. Let's look at the next verse. Here in Genesis 49, he goes on. His eyes shall be red with wine, and his teeth white with milk. This is a continuation of verse 11. This is a continuation of this poetic image of affluence. Uh, This kind of summarizes uh, the prosperity of the tribe of Judah. Now, when was... When was uh, Judah, when was Israel the most prosperous? Very good, Daryl. Yeah, under King David. That was a high water mark. All those boundaries and borders you see on that map, that was under King David. That didn't happen right away. It took centuries to get to that point. But under David and then his son Solomon, they... Israel was one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest nation on the face of the earth under King David. Uh, And so this prosperity, that uh, earthly prosperity that God is prophesying here for Judah, uh, really reached its peak uh, under King David and Solomon. Uh, But again... That's just the earthly part of it. More so, the kingdom of David's descendant, Jesus Christ, that kingdom is the kingdom of what? All believers. All who believe in him as their God, their creator, their savior. Uh, We reach our greatest prosperity, our greatest joy, Uh, under Jesus, under Shiloh, in heaven. Uh, Let's uh, keep our place here, and I want to go back to Isaiah again. This was the passage that we read uh, last Sunday for the uh, Old Testament lesson in worship, that great Isaiah passage in Isaiah 55, Isaiah 55, verse 1. You talk about a poetic picture of prosperity. This is page 810, by the way, in the church Bibles, 810. Isaiah 55. Remember, what, what, what God is prophesying here through Judah is more than just earthly prosperity. It's heavenly prosperity in the kingdom of God, not an earthly kingdom. Uh, this is a promise to all believers in Shiloh, in his kingdom. And here it's repeated in the same poetic way in Isaiah 55, verse 1. Page 810, it begins, ho, H-O, everybody have that? Ho, in other words, listen up, listen here, ho, everyone, anyone, anyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat, yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price, you see the wine and the milk? You see how that correlates to the verse that we're looking at in Genesis 49? The other 
sign of prosperity was milk. You got wine and you got milk. Of course, you got water too. You need water. But even more precious than water is wine and milk, which were like water, but are like fortified water. And uh, so here in Isaiah 55, verse 1, God is again painting this poetic picture of, 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 of wealth, of prosperity, of good times, of joy, happiness, celebration, everything going well. And it's a picture of heaven. It, and does it cost you any money? This is, this is the ultimate prosperity, isn't it? If you have no money, come, eat it, get it. It's free. What's he talking about there? Heaven. Heaven's free. Heaven's a free gift. Most people don't know that. They think they have to earn it. And they think they can earn it, but they're not sure. I think I've been good enough. I think I've lived a good enough life. I think I have pleased God enough. But I'm not sure. I might get to heaven. I might not. I don't know. Nobody knows until the time comes. That's their attitude. They don't understand. No, it's not up to you. You don't have to go to God and buy heaven. You can't. You have no money. You have nothing to buy heaven with. What's the price of heaven? Perfection. Jesus said you must be perfect. As your Father in heaven is perfect. Where are you going to get that? You don't have that, that kind of money. You don't have that perfection. No matter how hard you try, you're a sinner. You've, you've disobeyed God. You haven't pleased Him. With your life, your thoughts, your words, you've, you've displeased Him. You have no money, but come, He says, come anyway without money. Then I'll give you wine and milk without price. It's free. Forever in heaven. I've earned it for you, God says, through my only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. The son of Judah, the descendant of Judah and David, the great eternal king. That's why he came into the world, to give you the free gift, to earn for you the free gift of heaven by dying for your sins, atoning for your sins in your place as your substitute. You can have infinite prosperity in heaven forever, without end, free. So going back to Genesis 49. Judah sees all this. I mean, uh, Jacob sees all this as he's talking to Judah. He sees this great Savior coming from Judah. He can see with an eagle eye afar off, prophetically here. He sees how, in a matter of generations, from Judah's seed will come the great Shiloh. So here we are back in Genesis 49, verse 12. His eyes shall be red with wine, his teeth white with milk. Here is described, again, a place of plenty. A place where you have have no, no shortages Nothing that's not provided in, in abundance. Here you, you live in peace. Here there, there are no enemies. You've, you've defeated all your enemies. You're, you're gone from, from the place where people hate you for your faith in Jesus Christ. You've left this world's uh, sinfulness. And now you're just happy all the time. And everyone else there is in full agreement with you. You all know the truth, the full truth. Uh, and, and you all believe the same thing, and you all uh, are under the blessings of the same God in heaven. What a happy place. What a happy fellowship. Uh, and that's, that's the description more in verse 12 of heaven than of the land of Judah on earth. Uh, so uh, there you have in verse 12 again this continuation of this prosperity 
Uh, but uh, more so the prosperity of heaven. Did I see a hand? No? But anyway, the, 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 the greatest thing is in verse 10. Until Shiloh come. The coming of the peace bringer. The coming of the promised Savior. That's what it's all about. Now, after Shiloh come, what will happen in verse 10? The scepter will depart from Judah. Right? Then there will be no more need for Judah. No more need for the Jews. No more need for the land of Judea. It will have produced its promised fruit. The Shiloh. The Messiah will have come and then you don't need Judah anymore. So its prosperity will end. Its earthly prosperity will end. uh, The tribe of Judah at that time, according to verse 10. But it was good that God did so in order that no false ideas should lodge in Israel concerning Judah's blessing here. The greater blessings that are being promised here are through Shiloh, not in an earthly kingdom, but in an eternal kingdom. You know, uh, when Judah which called Judea at the time of Jesus. Uh, and Jerusalem was in Judea. Uh, what kind of a Messiah was the church preaching then? A king, right? But what kind of a king? Yeah, an earthly king. Like, like the Roman Empire, the Caesar. You know, an earthly kingdom. And uh, so it was uh, uh, looking for a, an earthly king, an earthly deliverer, a, a, a Shiloh who would bring uh, earthly prosperity. And when Jesus didn't live up to that, they rejected him. Okay? If Judah had continued on after Jesus died on the cross, rose from the dead, and ascended visibly into heaven, what would have happened? It was wiped out a few years after Jesus ascended into heaven. Why did God allow that to happen? Why did the scepter depart from Judah then? Shiloh had come. The scepter departed from Judah. Judah was destroyed forever. That was the reason, but... There's a secondary reason. What if God had allowed you to continue? Those false ideas would have continued of the Messiah. Yeah, but they're scattered out now. But if they had stayed there, they would have said, Oh, see, this proves that Jesus wasn't the Messiah. We're still here. We're still waiting. But God wiped it off the map. To say... Here's another sign that the Messiah has come. Judah doesn't exist anymore. The the Shiloh has come. Judah's gone. The scepter has departed from it. So that no false ideas that that Israel had at that time of Jesus would would, uh, continue. All right? Go to verse 13. Because now we shift away from Judah to Zebulun. Do you have any other questions about Judah before we continue? Judah turns out to be the most important and lasting tribe in Israel. Well, again, they aren't the Jews. I know what you mean. They call themselves Jews, but they're not Jews. Um, well, they think they are. Pardon me? They think they are. They think they are, but they're wrong. Just like most people are wrong. <laughs> Don't believe everything you hear. Uh, false ideas, lies, and so forth are abundant in this world. The truth is hard to find. Uh, yeah, uh, the Muslims think they're the true 
people of God. The Hindus think they're the true people of God. I mean, every religion thinks they're the true people of God, but they're all wrong. They're all false. Sure they do. That's why they call themselves Jews. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. They have a Jewish religion that they cling to. That doesn't make them physical descendants of Abraham necessarily. Some may be, some may be not. All we know is that the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through the 12 tribes were wiped off the map 2,000 years ago or more. Now, yeah, they probably have some descendants somewhere as they scatter to the four corners of the earth. But how do we know who they are? They have no land. They had no land for 2,000 years. How do we know who they are? But they, they cling to this Jewish religion. And what's the hallmark of the Jewish religion today? We don't believe in Jesus. That's their hallmark. We don't, we've rejected Jesus as the Christ. He is not the Messiah. None of the promises of the Old Testament refer to Jesus. That, that's the Jewish religion today. So are they really like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? No. No. They, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob saw Jesus from afar in their prophetic writings. They heard God tell of the coming Shiloh, coming Messiah. And they knew it would be like Jesus. But these, these others who claim to be Jews today, they don't have that faith. They don't have faith in Jesus. Okay? So, they're not spiritual descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they're probably not even physical descendants. We don't know. We don't know. There's no proof of that. And this land that they claim over there, that they call Israel, that was a... Uh, an artificial creation of the British government after World War I. Okay? That's all it is. It's nothing like the Old Testament Israel. They have no temple. They have no king. They have no descendant of David. You know, the scepters departed from Judah. It's like it says, it happened when Shiloh, Jesus Christ, came. But please don't fall for these lies of the world. I tell you, oh, those are the Jews. The Baptists fall for it. Uh, all of the people who follow this millennialistic uh, false doctrine fall for it. They think, oh, these are the people of God. No, the people of God are the real Jews, the spiritual descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the people who believe both the Old and the New Testament in their entirety, who believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the promised Shiloh. Those are the real Jews. You are a Jew. If you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are Israel. You are Jacob. You are Zion. You are all those things that the Bible talks about. And it talks about Zion and Jacob, and Abraham, and all that. You are his true descendants. You are the children of Abraham. Jesus said to those Jewish leaders in his day, you're not children of Abraham. You're children of the devil. You're not children of God. You're children of the devil. Because you don't believe in me as your Shiloh, your Messiah, your Christ, your Savior. You've rejected me. In fact, you want to murder me. So don't think that you are children of Abraham. Abraham rejoiced to see me, Jesus said. He saw me and was glad. In other words, he, he, he could see me from afar, that I would be coming. I am the one that he saw. I'm the one he believed in. I'm the one he rejoiced in, put faith in, the one he went to heaven in. 
so that heaven is called Abraham's bosom. Those are the real Jews. It's you, you who believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Don't let anybody fool you about that. These other people are fake Jews. It's a deception of Satan to think that they are children of God or or, or the apple of God's eye or whatever they want to call themselves. And that they're all going to be saved. This is what the Baptists think. This is what the Millennialists think. All the Jews, everyone calls themselves a Jew will be saved. That flies right into the heart of the Bible. Who's going to be saved according to the Bible? The Jews? No. Those who believe in God the Son as their Lord and Savior. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And they've rejected him, this Jewish religion today. They're not going to heaven. Jesus said to them in his day, you'll die in your sins. Just because you're a physical descendant of Abraham doesn't mean you're going to heaven. Because of your genes. Okay? They are not Jews. They follow a Jewish religion that they call a Jewish religion, a false religion. A religion that has rejected Jesus Christ, but that's all they are. They're not going to heaven. They're not going to be saved unless they repent and turn to Jesus as their Messiah, who has already come, has already died and paid for all their sins. Otherwise, they will die in their sins. Anything else on Judah before we go to the next one, Zebulun? The next son of Jacob, Zebulun. Now, there's only one verse on Zebulun, right? Not like Judah. Judah had how many verses? 8 through 12. He had five verses, more than any of the others. Why? Well, that's appropriate. He's the most important because he's going to lead to Jesus. So, God didn't say as much about the other sons. But now we come in verse 13 to Zebulun. And it says, what of Zebulun? What's the first three words of verse 13? Zebulun shall dwell. Yeah, Zebulun shall dwell. And the key word there is dwell because Zebulun means dwell. <laughs> See how he's playing off the name again? Just as Judah means praise, look at the first words of verse 8 when he talks about Judah, about how his brethren will praise him. Zebulun means dwell. Now that's important. Where you dwell. What does dwell mean? Live. Yeah, to look, where you live is important. It's not a minor thing. Where you live is important. You want to live in heaven, don't you? You don't want to live in hell. Where you are is important. Your dwelling place is important. You should choose it carefully, not just let it happen. Where you dwell is important, and that's the emphasis on the word Zebulun, dwell. Zebulun shall dwell. Okay? And uh, so here we have the Holy Ghost now shifts Jacob's thoughts to prophesy on the tribe of Zebulun. And now Zebulun is not the fifth son by age. Okay? The first four were his first four sons by age. First born. First four born. Zebulun was not the fifth born. He was actually the tenth born. Okay? Okay? So here we're going to shift gears. Why is Zebulun next? Well, we don't know exactly. But again, uh, as, as God did in chapter 48 with Ephraim and Manasseh, he picks the younger and puts them over the older. 
And Zebulun's full brother is Issachar, who's next. So here he has shifted Zebulun the younger first over Issachar the older. Here we see this shift again. God doesn't do what you expect. He doesn't take in the order that man thinks is important. He chooses to go outside of what man thinks is important and says, no, I think this was more important. So Zebulun is actually the uh, sixth son of Jacob by Leah. He's the last son by Leah, who was his first wife. Right? These four sons are by Leah. And remember, how did he marry Leah? He didn't want to. It was thrown in secretly by his evil uncle Laban. So he had his first four children by Leah. And then later on, he will have two more children by Leah. He will have a total of six children by Leah. And the last one is Zebulun. So these are all full brothers. And then the sixth one will be Issachar. And he is the fifth son of Jacob and Leah. Okay? So we're going to get all the sons of Leah first. These are all by Leah. But even these are out of order. Because Issachar was born before Zebulun. So now we've got the order established. And God, the Holy Ghost, who's inspiring Jacob on his deathbed to say these things, the Holy Ghost shifts Jacob's prophecy now to Zebulun. And... We're out of time, so with that introduction to Zebulun, we will attack him next. And it's important, again, key in on the word dwell. Just as Jacob does, just as God does. He's going to teach us something about dwelling. Where you live is important. Shall we close with a benediction? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.